Hey folks, I'm here today to talk to you about the two to four player game, The Faceless. The Faceless is a truly unique game that came out of Kickstarter circa uh, 2018. It did okay. Uh, it didn't knock the world on fire, but it did all right. Uh, Tubby, did you want to point out something? <laughs> It's a game that did okay on Kickstarter, I guess. Uh, I'm not really sure what the, what the measure of okay is, but it made four hundred thirteen thousand uh, dollars. It had five thousand six hundred and forty four backers, so that's a pretty decent amount, it seems like. Uh, oh, they were going to release another game, so they were about to release. Uh, I guess it looks like an RPG for Dusk World, which is the world that they call this. That one came out in December, but then it eventually kind of faded away. I don't think it ever funded, uh, got about halfway and fizzled out like so many others. This is a game that, again, that was kind of early in my Kickstarter days, and I bought it just because it was, uh, some of the mechanisms and things seemed really interesting and different. I'm not a huge fan of the chibi art. I hate the big head people art. I don't like it. <laughs> That's why I don't care how many people tell me Marvel United is great. I don't like chibis. I don't, I don't like them, and I don't want to play with them. In this case, it wasn't super overwhelming, and, uh, and I thought that the way they did the miniatures looked really compelling. So I thought it would, it would definitely lend itself to being painted and, and look, uh, look even neater that way. The other thing I went with was the 3D components. So uh, I've got the tokens, of course, but I also have these neat... 3D components that you kind of assemble and and paint to look like they do here. So real quick on the painting side of this, uh, I used the contrast paints or basically the the speed paints. I think it's Warmaster makes the makes the competitor to the Games Workshop uh, contrast paints. They're called uh, speed paints. I used mostly that to paint these, and uh, I did it all in about uh, I don't know about five settings. Something else I did when I went ahead and finished these out is I sealed the magnets inside with green stuff. Uh, I made sure that there's plenty of green stuff inside to kind of kind of keep it. Uh, it gets super sticky uh, when it's at a certain state. So I wrapped the magnet in there and I got it as close to the middle so it was being grabbed in a bunch of different ways. And then I uh, stuffed green stuff on either side. So it's not completely green stuff inside but it's probably got a fair amount inside each one and I tried to make a nice smooth finish on the on the outside of this and just sort of hide the little hole where the magnets were. One big thing that this does especially for the main character that moves around in the middle is it makes their base a lot smaller. Uh, the way this came out of the factory they had a little they have a little uh, plastic piece that fits on the bottom of this and it, it's sort of reminiscent of those things that you see like in a Simon game that uh, with the different colors to identify the different players for unpainted models and stuff, or maybe even what the model is, uh, if you need a color to identify it. But all of these had that, and it had the kind of a dual purpose of showing you the polarity, because it kind of marked the polarity, and it kind of held the magnets in. But it didn't even come all the way up, it kind of came up halfway, and it, it just kind of made all of these a little bit chunkier. The thing that makes a huge difference, though, is uh, for this guy in the middle, when he would go to move around the terrain, he was already, even without that thing on here, he's bigger than these spots where he has to move. So he couldn't negotiate uh, past obstacles very well. And you were always knocking them around. You know, with that thing attached to the bottom of it, it was so big that it was just kind of a joke. He, he didn't fit in the spaces at all. He was almost twice as big as the circles were. And if you wanted to use the 3D pieces and stuff, he was really knocking this stuff around because it's not as easy as just walking on top of a cardboard token. So anyway, sealing that up made that a hundred times better. Uh, it's still a little bulky, like I said, but it's not like, uh, it's not really annoying, I guess. That bulk didn't really affect the ones on the outside that move around, but they are, they do seem a lot nicer this way. Uh, one thing I didn't do is I didn't paint on the polarity. I didn't change the colors. Uh, these miniatures look quite a bit different from one side to the other, and it's obvious that they've got sort of their negative Dusk World side and then their positive side, which looks more normal, like regular children. Although, this one in particular is in yellow here is in a lot of peril, it seems. <laughs> I think the green guy looks the happiest 
of the other ones in Dusk World. Well, oh, Blue doesn't look unhappy either, ripping his book apart. Okay, so here's a brief overview of the game. Uh, it does have variable player powers. So uh, at the beginning of the game, you're going to pick a character, and they've all got a real simple, easy-to-learn power. That's their kind of special ability for the game. Uh, the way this works is we are all this compass. There's a small compass that's on the board. It did have a little thing that it sits on top of, but I find it a little bit easier to move around as, as just the compass. But that sits on the board, and that kind of represents all of us trying to use our consciousness to move through this uh, dusk world. It's got a real Stranger Things vibe to it. These other components here, we've got a yellow, a blue, and a green uh, little child on, from Dusk World, and the billy goat in the middle, they all have magnets inside of them. And you can change the polarity of the magnet just by uh, kind of rotating these characters around or moving them around the outside of the board. The three colors for the children stay only around the outside of the board and they can't cross each other. So uh, they basically can only move around the periphery of the game board. Billy Goat, the bad guy that's kind of on the board hunting you down, uh, he's actually on the board. So fighting his influence can be pretty difficult. You're going to be moving this compass around by playing cards. Okay. You're going to be moving this compass around by playing cards from your hand. Uh, the different colored cards affect different uh, things on the board that you can manipulate, like red cards, for instance. You can move Billy Goat one space and rotate him in a different way, uh, thus changing the polarity on here and moving this needle a little bit, usually. And you can do something similar uh, for a, a green, yellow, or blue card. You can move the, uh, the character around on the side and then also change the polarity. And by doing that, you'll be able to manipulate which direction that compass is moving. Uh, at the bottom of that card, it's going to have a number. And that number is how many spaces it's going to move. Then you have to move that compass one space at a time and see where it ends up. And that needle will, will change as you move. So you have to be really careful. So if at any point uh, you run into a piece of terrain, like you bump into a piece of terrain, or if Billy Goat ever eventually gets to you, then it's game over. Uh, if you've already acquired some of these memories, and, and these memories are represented by little metal coins, and they're spread, there's a rule for how to spread them around on the board. So uh, you're going around and you're trying to acquire all of these. If you get all of these, then you win. So if you have one of these and you run into a piece of terrain or Billy Goat gets on top of you, uh, you can discard it to kind of have a mulligan a do-over and you won't instantly die. The other thing they can do is they have little special abilities and uh, after you've acquired this you also get a one-time special thing that you can do uh, where you move it up and use it and it'll let you maybe manipulate some of these or uh, move the token in any way that you want. It, there's a lot of different things that it does. If you eventually capture all of the little metal coins, the memories, the players win and it's game over. So this game has a bit of a timer also. Uh, I mentioned that these were dual-use cards. So at the end of every turn, you're going to pull one of these and place it in one of these lanes. And these lanes will determine what happens to you. And most of them include something uh, involuntary, like uh, the purple will cause them to involuntarily move uh, however many cards are on there, that many spaces. Uh, the red ones let Billy Goat move that many spaces towards us, and he always comes towards us. Uh, a lot of involuntary things happening there. Eventually, you'll be playing your cards out of your hand, and uh, you'll be empty, and you'll be able to draw back up out of these lanes, making each of these things a little bit less dangerous as time goes on. So as you play the game, you're managing uh, the damage and stuff that can be done to you involuntarily by pulling your cards at the right time and choosing the lanes to pull them out of that will help you the most. While it's not completely without some randomness, I mean, uh, you don't choose the, the cards that are dealt to you in the initial hand, but you do get to choose ones later. You do have random events affecting you uh, as the game goes on, but you can sort of mitigate the issues with those random pulls by pulling certain cards out of here when you redraw into your hand. I have to say, navigating this little compass around is quite difficult and takes uh, a bit of practice. 
really uh, the first game that you play with this should just be <laughs> considered entirely a test game. Every time your compass moves from one space to another, you have to sort of reevaluate where the needle's pointing. Uh, if you're really lucky, it'll sort of point in the middle of two circles, and then you can choose which one that you go to. It's a funny little gimmick uh, for this game with the magnets and the compasses and stuff. I, I thought it was really interesting. I don't really have any other game that kind of uses components in exactly this way. And although I'm not thrilled about the art, I thought that they did a pretty good job. Uh, like, it's not so chibi that it just is extremely off-putting. I feel like this is a game that if it done a little bit better on Kickstarter would have been an even better game. <laughs> and uh, I don't think it gets a lot of attention uh, because it was so weird and obscure when it came out. These days, even a weird, wonderful game like The Faceless is uh, it's just white noise compared to all the, the clutter that comes out of Kickstarter. If you do have this game, I highly encourage you to go ahead and just seal up those magnets and make some easier. They can fit then you'll be able to put these things back into their uh, little component trays and keep them all nice. If, uh, I love, I appreciate that they have, uh, they have an insert that fits the miniatures. Before you'd have to disassemble them completely because those little rings that fit on the top just really didn't allow the miniatures to go back inside. But when I paint them, I really, I want some sort of tray or something to put them in. I could always add foam or something else later, but it's really handy if they're just already there. And, uh, and paint it up and sealed, I can put them all, all the way back into the box uh, and they're nice and safe. The cards and everything seem pretty good. They, they don't seem super thin. Uh, the board itself is really nice. I love the, how colorful it is. The metal coins are great. Uh, these little metal memory coins. It did come with a, like a whole bunch of different little sort of expansions. And in the back of the book, they say if you played so many times, uh, try this other expansion and that other expansion. They have all kinds of little ways to make things more challenging and interesting. I, of course, haven't played uh, with all of these. Uh, I've only just started to experiment a little bit uh, from the base game. It's been, uh, it's been such a huge learning experience just kind of getting to where my wife and I can work together to move this compass around. Uh, it is a very, very tricky game to get at first, but once you kind of get the feel for it, it's, it becomes a, a fun, unique challenge. I'll say that. The table presence, once it's painted, uh, made a huge difference too. Uh, this just is not as impressive in plastic. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I think that's true for just about any game, but this one's an easy enough one to paint up. So if you're kind of a painter type and uh, you want a really different, unique game, this might be worth looking into. There's really not much to paint, even if you get the 3D terrain and uh, you paint all that up. It's really not a lot to kind of get this all up and ready for the table. And that's about it for the faceless. If you'd like to see more painted reviews, you can click over here. If you'd like to maybe see what YouTube thinks you'll like off my channel, you can click over here. Of course, feel free to subscribe. I'd love to see you again. Enjoy your games, and I'll see you soon.